Welcome to Quilting's first reality show, live and unscripted, with Susan Smith. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my studio. I am Susan Smith. My studio is Stitched by Susan, and we're working on an edge-to-edge -to -edge today project of a small table topper, and this is actually going to be part one of two episodes, and they're related, a table topper and a table runner that's long and slim. So it's an Easter project, and there's going to be links in the show notes for all the materials and pattern, all courtesy of the Fat Quarter Shop. So they're making those available, and it's quite simple piecing, you'll see, so you could still get it finished in time for Easter. So I'm going to be showing the entire project from end to end. This is not a live taping because we pre-recorded. However, it is real time, and it is definitely unscripted. So you kind of get to look over my shoulder in my studio as I complete this project, right from the loading, through the threading, quilting, etc., and all the way to the end. So you can actually see how long things take, how often thread breaks happen, because they do, and things like that. So let's um, talk about a few things before we dive in, and I'll keep my coffee in hand. I know it says hello fall, and I know we're coming into spring, but it's just such a nice big cup for my coffee. A um, few things before we get going. A um, couple places that you can find me. One is this YouTube channel, obviously. If you're enjoying this show, please would you like and subscribe and share it too with some of your friends. It's so helpful to get more quilters being able to see what this kind of reality show of quilting is all about. Then too, you can find me on my website. I have a gallery of photographs there. I have some learning opportunities there, some of my favorite resources, and many of those are also in the show notes from every one of these YouTube episodes so that you can see my red snapper clips or my favorite ruler or some of my favorite needles that I use. They're all listed in the show notes. I also have a podcast. It's called Measure Twice, Cut Once and other life lessons learned from quilters. And it is often with a guest, not always a quilter, but some kind of crafter or creator. And sometimes the episodes are just me, but they air generally every Wednesday morning. Not every Wednesday, but generally. So Measure Twice, Cut Once, you can find that at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. And there you can choose your favorite listening app, Apple, whatever. Um, what else do I want to tell these folks about, Dave? A, a few credits that I should give too. Before I do that, if you're interested in supporting this show, you can do that very easily at buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. Mr. Producer will put a link for you. Um, there you can make a contribution for as little as $5 or you can make a monthly one if you so choose. And all of the funds that come in through that, we pour back into getting better equipment and lights and camera and all the things. Maybe you've noticed today I have bright, bright, bright lights over my head. So things should be very well lit today. And I'm curious to hear your feedback if you see a difference in that in the quilting itself, if it's more clear and visible for you. So again, buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. And a few credits that I want to acknowledge too. Our son Will always does the voices that are in the introduction. Today was the Major General. If you've watched that um, old movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. And also my husband Dave. He's Mr. Producer and there he is behind the scenes. There's lots and lots of cords and wires and hubs and routers and all those things. He keeps all those running smoothly for me because this really is not a one woman show. I could not do this by myself. And finally, but very importantly, our good friend Dan allows us to use his guitar music for these sessions. And sadly, his album is not available commercially, but we sure do appreciate the fact that he lets us listen to it while we're on air. So thanks for joining me. And I think we'll go ahead and get started. So once again, today's project is going to be edge to edge quilting and totally freehand. So I'm going to load the backing while you watch the batting, the quilt, and we'll talk a little bit about the squaring up process. There are no particular challenges in the quilt that I'm working on today. No wonkiness, no wavy borders or anything like that. But we will still talk about how I routinely baste and square them up. And then on into the quilting process. And as I mentioned, this is one of a two-part series. So tonight I'll be loading the entire backing and quilting the first part, which is a small square table topper. In the next episode, I will be quilting the matching table runner, and it's going to be on the same backing. So I'll show you at the end of tonight's episode how I prep for loading that secondary piece on. So without further ado, let us load the backing. Okay. 
So what I've got here is 108 inch wide backing and it is cut. Here's the selvage on the narrow end. Which camera are we looking at? That one. Okay. Can you see that? So I've got a nice straight edge on the front of my machine and that's what I like for attaching this front edge. I just want to get a bit of slack in the fabric. There we go. I'm going to grab my red snappers. These are my favorite way of loading. If you've been around a while, you've heard me talk about them before. Basically, there's a small, I'm behind the machine, so you can't see it there. I'll show you when I do the other end of the quilt. How's that? There's just a little rod in the hem and I just snap these clamps right on. So that's why this first straight edge is important. It sets me up for the rest of the quilt. You may have noticed that I don't measure or center the quilt in any way. And you'll see why as I go along. But it is important that I have that first straight edge. After that, I'm going to toss the rest of the backing all over the rail of the quilting machine. And then I walk around to this side and pull it all smooth so it's you know, not tight, but has no deep folds in it anymore. And this came to me, I mentioned that it's from the Fat Quarter Shop, so it came to me in the mail. And so this backing does have some significant creases in it from folding, but rather than pressing, here's my magic time-saving technique. I've got a little spray bottle, which I will come around and show you so you can see it just a spray bottle full of water and I'm lightly misting the whole thing but I'm taking care in a few places I can see that there were very fine pleats almost in the fabric which is super common and I will make sure that those get moistened and what this does just in two or three minutes it's going to cause that fabric to just relax and all those creases will relax without very much effort on my part again wherever there look to be stubborn creases a little more misting going on. And already I can see them relaxing. So that's all it takes. That is an incredible time saver. So from there, I've checked to make sure that my fabric is smooth on this top rail and that it is proceeding straight over the long arm. If I was seeing any wrinkles in it because it's pulling to one side or the other, I would need to adjust for that. So that's how I can get away with no centering of my quilt, centering of this end and centering of that end. I just put a straight edge on, make sure it's straight, and then roll it on. Here we go. It's like magic how rapidly quilts load this way. It's really, truly like magic. So I am standing here watching as I roll that there are no wrinkles forming. You can see a few in here. So when I see that happening, I come and make adjustments. And I'm not sure how well you could see those creases earlier, but now as the fabric is going over, you can see that they've relaxed. As you can see, sometimes I have to make several adjustments, but it's still a lot faster than centering methods. So now I'm just watching to see when it comes near to the end of my leader. And what I've got that you can't really see on camera, this is my take up bar. So as the quilting is finished, this is where the quilt is going to roll up. On this side of it, I've got what's called a dead bar or a leveler bar. So when I'm quilting, my quilt goes across under that leveler bar and up onto the take up bar. So I've actually got my leader. Let me see if I can show you at this end. Rolled over that leveler bar and flopped down the back. That means that when I connect my backing to it, it's going to be oriented in the right way to slide under that leveler bar. So watch for that as I unroll it. It won't make a lot of sense while I'm talking about it, but you'll see it as I unroll it. So 
So again, double checking that there's no creases in my fabric here. And as it happens, I have a nice selvage edge on this side, but if I didn't, even if it wasn't straight, it wouldn't matter. I would just let the excess hang off because that first edge was straight. And I know that I've rolled it on straight. So my snappers are going to create a straight edge on this side. And they're just snapping, remember, onto that little plastic rod that's inside the hem of my leader. So having that done, now I've rolled that leader over. You heard it probably flop. And it is now winding under the leveler bar and onto the take-up lever or take-up bar. I'm going to back it up just a hair so that you're able to see the beginning. So Mr. Producer is over here on the floor moving cameras around so that you can see this actually and it will make a little more sense for you then. He's going to change camera views and I'll point it out for you. He's, try he's trying to. <laughs> I think we have five cameras going tonight, so it's a bit of a juggling act. Hang on one second while we figure this out. This is what being unscripted is all about. You get to not only see quilting reality show, but camera reality show. Two for the price of one. No? Okay. Apparently it's coming. We won't hold our breath though, will we? surprise. Okay, so you can see it now. Here's my red snapper and this edge. Here's my take up bar. This is where my finished quilt is going to roll up. And here's my dead bar or leveler bar. And so I want my backing to go under that leveler bar and then to be rolled up. So when I'm putting my backing onto the leader, I literally pulled excess into this leader and flopped it over that side. That orients it right. If I had my leader all rolled up on this bar and not underneath here and then attach the leader, it would be a tangle and it wouldn't be rolling up on the right side and the leveler bar would not be on top of it. So there's my long explanation of a short project. Okay, let's get on to loading. Let me grab the batting. Mr. Producer is chuckling because apparently my head is chopped off in pretty well every shot. This is how it goes sometimes. So what I'm using is Hobbs 8020. This is 80% cotton, 20% polyester. So it has the small amount of shrinkage that cotton has, and it also has the a little bit of the loft that polyester offers and some of the durability. This is my go-to favorite batting. And maybe I'll hold up our little quilt so you can see the little Easter eggs. See how cute? So I'm actually going to be quilting it sideways. That's why I thought you might want to see them first so you can identify them as eggs. So once again, this is a project for the Fat Quarter Shop and they're going to be making this pattern and fabric available for sale um, a little later in March. So when this episode airs on YouTube, there will be links attached. Well, we are airing on YouTube. What am I saying? I'm just recording early. Um, there are links in the show notes where all the items can be purchased that are in this kit or this project. Okay, one other thing that I want to do tonight, which I don't typically do, but might be useful for you to see. I was recently at a quilt show. I think I can be seen. This one, here we are. Whew. Gotcha. I was recently at a quilt show and I was exploring one of the thread vendors and checking out some different threads. I've kind of been stuck in my routine of using isocord thread. It is my favorite. It works super well. I am so familiar with it, but I want to try some other things, right? So I brought home some new top thread and bobbin thread. And tonight I'm going to load the bobbin thread on and it is Deco Bob brand and it's an 80 weight. So a very fine thread. One of the beauties of a very fine thread, not surprisingly in the bobbin, is you can load so much of it on an M-class bobbin. So it lasts forever and ever, it seems like. However, I have not had an opportunity to quilt with it very much. So what I've done is I've just left a little bit of space at the top of my quilt. I know that I have plenty of batting and plenty of backing. So I've just grabbed from my scrap bin a strip, a scrappy strip of fabric. And I'm just gonna lay that along the top 
and quilt in it a little bit and run a few doodles just to make sure that my tension is correct in case I need to adjust that bobbin at all. So that's what we're going to do first and then we'll get into quilting. And I do in fact have isocord loaded on the top and it is just a pale pale pink. Um, it's hard for you to see I know in the camera but the background of this is a tiny pink uh, looks like a cross hatch. It's not quite a gingham. Very delicate pink. There we go. Now you can see the pretty pink. Let us know how the viewing is for you in terms of light. So I do have the lights of my machine on and if we need to we can turn those off. But let's try it this way. I've got them on just kind of at a low level. So when I'm checking out the tension I try to check corners straight lines and curves. That seems to cover all the bases, right? So here's a few loop-de-loops. And those few things will give me a good sense of how my tension is. And now I'm just reaching under the quilt. I could have quilted closer to the edge. And I'm running my fingernail very firmly on the underside of those stitches. And that enables me to know if the tension on the bottom side feels good. If there was any eyelashes or laddering, I would feel that right away with my fingernail. And of course I can see on top. I can see that it's not pulling tight and flat. I can see that it is holding in each corner. It's not pulling a visible loop. So I'm satisfied that tension is pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and break thread. And that funky little strip will just get trimmed off when the quilt is finished. Right. So now I'm going to proceed to my basting. This is something that to me is absolutely non-negotiable. I know there are quilters that don't do it. I'm not sure what they're thinking, but I'll tell you why I think it's important. There is no doubt that when you quilt an area of fabric and you've got that fluffy layer of batting in between, it is going to pull up a little bit. So I think it is absolutely critical that all the edges of your working area be stabilized and held in place. So I do that by basting the left, the top, and the right, and then I'll show you in a moment. I'll put magnetic bars on the front, giving me a uh, stable and defined work surface that will not shift as I'm quilting. I have done this basting with often with my regular stitch, but I quite like the basting stitch on Stella, my Bernina, and so lately I've been using the quarter inch basting stitch to do this, and I quite like it. And it's just as easy as a push of a button to change. Stella is very good. Stella, by the way, is the name of my long arm. She's very, very good about naturally staying in a straight line. So if I just give her a gentle nudge, she quilts perfectly straight up the back side of this quilt. But I am going to put my channel lock on for that top straight edge. I don't find it as easy to give it a nudge on the horizontal line and keep it in place. And having that channel lock in ensures that I have a perfectly straight top, top edge on my quilt. All in the interests of getting a very square result when it's all said and done, right? If you have any questions about these processes as I'm going, Feel free to type them into the chat window and between advances of the quilt we will stop and read some of the questions and put them on the screen and I will answer them. And if you're watching this as a replay, still feel free to type in questions. I do my very best to come back and answer all of them. I'm going to trim off that scrap. It's really getting in my way here with my very, 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 very tiny scissors. There we go. As I mentioned, this quilt has no particular challenges. It's beautifully pieced, it's nice and flat, it's well pressed. So my job is to maintain that, so I don't have any easing in to do or anything like that on the edges. I'm just shifting my fabric to be straight with my stitching because I know that my stitching is straight. 
and you'll see here as I go down this edge, my batting is just wide enough and I'm actually using, I'm actually using just a um, scrap of batting because it is such a small quilt. It was a piece left over from beside another quilt. And so it's just, just, just large enough. So I just clipped my channel lock off. That's how I get in my steps, by the way. One of the ways I get in my steps. And that's the basting on all three sides. And I like to give a good tug to this front edge of the quilt now. Often because I've been manipulating this top edge, there will kind of be a little rill of fabric up there. So I want to make sure that is all pulled down nice and smooth. I again check out my visual cues or my seam lines running nice and straight along this front rail. And then finally I put my few magnets on the bar. So that holds that front edge nice and securely in place. And I pretty much put them nose to tail across the whole front. I thought I had a short one here somewhere, but I don't know where it went. It's a long one. There we go. Okay, we are all set to start quilting. Let's just put our side snaps on for a little bit of tension on the sides. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes when I'm working on a quilt this small, I don't even bother with these. It seems like having wrinkles in your backing um, multiplies exponentially as the quilt gets larger. And on a small quilt, generally my experience is I can give the sides a nice tug and call it good. But since I'm showing you all the things, let's go ahead and put them on. These clamps are part of the red snapper system too. And what I love about them is that they're long and they fill up this whole space, almost all the space between my long arm rails, giving me nice even tension across the whole quilt surface. So there's my quilt ready to go. And I'm because I'm already at the top right hand corner, I'm going to start quilting there. No particular reason. I also could stop at the start at the top left hand corner. But this is where I am and this is what I choose today. So I've pulled up the bobbin thread. I'm hanging on to both. I'm going to do a few little anchoring stitches and we're up and away. Mr. Producer, how do we feel about the light, the driving light being on? Pardon me? I'm not a fan. Okay, let's try this, you guys. I'm going to pause for just a moment, and I'm going to turn the light down and see what we think of that. There it is off. Is that a better view? You guys chime in. It seems so reflective when the light is on. I, that's... It gets very, very bright. I've got it on the lowest possible setting there. So you guys vote on it. I'm going to leave it on that low light for the moment. If you preferred it without, and here it is one more time. But then we see some real shadows. That's an option too. So you guys feel free to chime in. Meantime, I will turn it back on. And we are up and away. And I'm going to go ahead and put my manual mode on because then you don't get the little red lights underneath. And that's pleasant too. So I'm just adjusting the speed for that. And here we go. And I'm quilting a fairly swirly design with a few kind of little hooks in it. They're a great way to fill up the odd little corners. My spacing between the lines is mm, three-eighths of an inch or so. A little scant half inch, I would say. Just in case you're not familiar with manual mode, which is what I'm stitching in now, what that means is that I preset, before I start quilting, the speed at which the motor and needle are going to go. And when I push start, the needle starts moving and it is going at 
an exactly constant pace. So that is often called the constant speed too, for that reason. And so now it's my job as a quilter to move smoothly and evenly and also to determine the stitch length with the speed of my movements. So if I move the machine super quickly, I will get much larger stitches. And if I dawdle too much in one place, I'll get very tiny stitches. However, this is my preferred way to quilt for sure, especially when I'm doing a large-ish edge-to-edge -edge project. It's just so, such a calming sound. And I definitely prefer it over the sound of the motor revving and slowing when I'm working for long periods of time. But that is a matter of personal preference. If you're just tuning in, we are working on a small table topper or small quilt. Um, Easter eggs are the design and it comes to you courtesy of the Fat Quarter Shop. So in the show notes, I have attached links for the fabrics, the pattern. Those are all available at the Fat Quarter Shop beginning today. This is a great little quilt for kind of showcasing some specialty fabrics because the eggs are large-ish. They're about five inches by six or four and a half by six. You see, you know, some, some space, some size of a single fabric. So it's not intricate piecing. It's a great way to show off a fun little collection of fabrics. And some of the prints you'll see as we get closer to them, to me are quite reminiscent of Ukrainian or Polish um, delicate and detailed egg painting. It's a very fitting line of fabrics to choose. And then of course this soft pink crosshatch really sets them off well. So this is episode one of two. So this small rectangular table topper is what we'll be quilting tonight. And then in episode two, is the same pattern but done in a smaller size as a long thin table runner with just one row of eggs and I'll be quilting a different design on that one as well. So I've loaded enough backing and batting for both of them and as I finish this table topper I will show you how I just set up and kind of prep in order to load that um, runner right on the heels of it. Whenever you can do that, it's a great time saver to only have to load a backing one time for two projects. My clients try and do that from time to time. I quilt a fair number of um, Quilt of Valor quilts and I encourage them to do that too. When they're purchasing wide backing, if they'll send me a top that or two tops that could use the same backing, then I can load once and quilt two. It not only saves loading time, but it saves quite a bit of fabric too, because you can butt one really right up against the last one. So you don't need that, um, the excess, you know, four or five inches of fabric, beginning and end. So a great little efficiency. If this quilting design appeals to you, by the way, it's been around for a long time. I believe Angela Walters was the first one to maybe invent it. 
Um, I watched a YouTube episode of hers some years back where she was showing it, and she calls it Hooks and Squirrels. So I encourage you to check out her episode. It's an older one, but she's such a great teacher, and she shows you step-by-step how to do it, how to travel around your quilt top, that sort of thing. So Hooks and Squirrels by Angela Walters. If Mr. Producer is giving you a wide enough angled shot, take note of kind of the big picture of how I'm moving across the quilt top. I always try and quilt the areas further away from me first so that I don't get painted into a corner far away from me that hasn't been quilted. And in general, I move in a kind of diagonal fashion across the quilt. And the reason I try to do that is so that I don't get rows of quilted motifs. And that's kind of important with these swirls because they're all very much alike. And if I put them one beside another or one above another, they're kind of going to look, you know, like they're all standing at attention. And I don't want that. I want it to look very organic and natural. And so one way to do that is to not move straight up and down or straight from side to side, but rather in this kind of diagonal fashion across the quilt top. And we're at the end of the first pass. So now I'm going to take down all my tension apparatuses. The magnetic bars come off the front. And these, by the way, are just inexpensive bars from my local hardware store. The type that you would use in your garage to hold some of your wrenches or hammers. The kind that you might use in your kitchen for your chef's knives. I know they weren't invented with the long arm quilter in mind, but they sure work wonderfully. All right, so I've advanced the quilt. I always walk along the front and do this kind of gentle tug including the batting. I'm pinching the batting under there a bit too, just to make sure that it's all smooth in underneath here. I'm watching my sides. I have not measured them, but I'm visually watching to make sure that they're staying straight. Likewise, my front, because I've got a lovely straight rail, I use that to gauge my seam lines against it, make sure that everything's staying square and straight. And once again, I've got my basting stitch on and I'm gonna run down the left here. And I think you can see, I'm pinching a little bit at the back, the part that's already been sewed. There's nothing challenging about this quilt. There's no ripples, but if I find anyways, that if I don't put a little tension on there, my hopper foot inevitably pushes the fabric in front of me and I get ripples where none existed before. So I always put just a little bit of tension behind where I've already stitched to keep the fabric going under the needle at a good pace. And if it was a problem quilt and I had ripples, I'd be putting more tension on there. But tonight, it's just a very little. A 
Let's go ahead and put our side clamp on while we're here. That this side is ready. Let's get a sip of coffee while we're here too, okay? Very important. I have a big mug and I've only drunk a few swallows of it. And once again, if you're just tuning in, working on an edge to edge project tonight, real time, from start to finish, loading and everything, um, I should mention the products that I am using, ones that I have not maybe said before. I have Isocord 40 weight thread on the top in a very pale pink. I have Deco Bob in the bobbin. And it's an 80 weight, so a very fine thread. And it is a cream color. Because it is so fine, I didn't feel it was hypercritical to match the threads, and they're both very light. The pink is super, super pale. And let's see what else. I have Hobbs 8020 batting, and I'm using the red snapper system to both attach my quilt backing at top and bottom, and these side clamps that I'm using are the red snapper system as well. And I'm quilting on my trusty Bernina Q24, which is new to me just a couple of months ago, but I would say we're pretty well acquainted by now. Okay, and another thing that I do to keep my um, quilted motifs looking natural and flowing is I try to alternate sides. You remember when I started, I started in the top right hand corner and I said it doesn't really matter where you start. Well, this is why, because this time I'm going to start on the left hand side. On this side, I've only got about three inches of backing here beside where I'm sewing. And the, the table, you can't really see it, but the table of my long arm is bumping into this clip just a little. Here's my low tech fix for that. I have a trusty yardstick and I'm just gonna tuck it right underneath my clamp. Can you see that? So it's just raising this up right here a little bit. And that little bit is all I need. I have two yardsticks, one for each end. They were my grandpa's way back when. And it's pretty cool to be able to use them. Okay, back in my manual mode. I was trying to move these threads here while I was stitching and I was afraid I was going to run over my finger. So let's get them out of the way. I do love quilting designs like this that are fairly even spacing throughout so that when all is said and done what you really see is texture and not the picture of whatever the design is. So I also kind of use that as a gauge for how close to place things. For example, you know if I'm if I'm getting into kind of an awkward corner and I'm trying to decide can I fit another swirl in there or do I need to put a hook in there or can I just leave that bit unquilted I kind of think of the size of my quilting most of my spacing here is half an inch or a little less apart so I do not want to leave an inch and a half area anywhere unquilted that will stick out like a sore thumb a sore thumb that puffy unquilted area so that's how I kind of gauge, you know, whether I need to tuck another little something in or not. And of course, if I was quilting much larger swirls, 
that space would be bigger that I could get away with. There's a nice dark egg. You can see the quilting a little bit. Some of these prints, it's very, very difficult to see, even from where I'm standing. <laughs> so this is a very small quilt or a table topper. The sweet little Easter egg design is published by the Fat Quarter Shop, and there are links in the show notes for the pattern, the fabrics, everything you need if you want to quickly whip up one of these before Easter, which is just a few weeks away. As you can see, the piecing is fairly simple and fairly large scale great way to show off these special little fabrics and not to chop them too small and a great way to get a project finished in a very short amount of time. This little one that I'm quilting over now is one of the fabrics I mentioned earlier that just reminds me so much of Ukrainian or Polish very intricately painted and decorated Easter eggs. design that I'm quilting was to the best of my knowledge first done by Angela Walters and she in fact has a YouTube episode that shows in detail how to do it. She walks you through it step by step and she calls it I believe hook and swirl. Certainly if you google Angela Walters and hook and swirl you will come up with her little tutorial 
on this quilting design. It is a great all-purpose one. I'm just going to stop and grab some of these threads that are laying here. Just a few of them. Some are mine, some are from piecing, but I don't want to stitch them in a thousand times. I was talking about the versatility of this quilting design. I mean, who doesn't love a swirl to begin with? They're always great things. But the little hook portion of it is so convenient for tucking into little corners that need just a little bit of quilting. And of course, you can go around the swirl once or one and a half times or two times or whatever you need to fill the space. So it is incredibly versatile. On other quilts, I've kind of played with it a bit by, for example, making the center circle much larger and it kind of makes these button looks when the quilt is finished. Or I've done swirls that have, you know, two or three times around and then Sometimes I've done it with just once around, so you can really play up the look of it just by changing those little things, but it's ultimately the same basic quilting path. This idea of quilting diagonally across the top means that now the top end of my quilt is finished and I'm filling in this lower corner that is closest to me and I won't have any awkward spaces that I cannot get into. It will not be quilted into a corner or out of a corner as the case may be. we are at the end of the second pass. Okay, Mr. Producer, sir, are there any questions we should be talking about? Well, because I'm doing something a bit unusual for me in recording this episode in advance of its release, I don't have all you viewers to chat with, but as I mentioned earlier, feel free to type questions into the comments whenever you are viewing it. I do my very best to get back and answer them. So I've tried to cover the tools that I'm using. But if there are more questions about that that I haven't thought of, by all means, bring them on. So again, we're seeing the end of the quilt now, right? This was my floating top, so this, this end was not rolled onto a bar. And so now it's floating up over the surface. But again, I'm giving that batting just a gentle tug and the whole quilt itself a gentle tug. And of course now I can see that end quite nicely to see that it's nice and straight. And just to be sure, I'm going to run my basting stitch along that bottom edge and I will put the channel lock on there again. Like I said, my long arm Stella is very good about going straight on the vertical lines if I'm very gentle and just nudge her along, she stays beautifully straight. It's not as easy to do on a horizontal line, so I am gonna go ahead and put that channel lock on. That just ensures that my quilt has a perfectly straight edge, which I quite like. And I've just got a quarter inch basting stitch on. And again, I'm keeping gentle tension on the end that has the side that's already been stitched, just to ensure that the fabric does not push out in front of the needle at all. So I'm finding here 
that I've got just a tiny bit of excess in here. I mean, it is minuscule. It's less than an eighth of an inch. But there's this is a very narrow border, so I don't want to mess with that width by taking a wider basting allowance here. So I'm going to go ahead and nudge my quilt bottom up just a little bit to keep the edge of my quilt straight with my basting stitch. And the swirls that we're quilting will pull that in super easily. It's such a little bit. It's a great illustration though because, you know, we're working with fabric and it has weave and it has give. And so there's always things that can be shifting and changing and it's kind of our job as a quilter. We're the last line of defense for sort of getting things squared away. Well, maybe not the last. The person who does the binding is the very last. But anyway, we have our part to play. there we've joined up with where we ended on this slide and now our quilt is fully basted so I don't need to put the magnets on the last time because that whole front end is secure but I will put my side clamps on quickly All right, in case you weren't able to see it before, I'm going to go over this again because I see it's really clear in this camera view. What I mean when I'm talking about the dead bar or the leveler bar, that's this chrome one that you're seeing here or aluminum. And what's happening is my, my quilt backing is rolling up over this front rail and it's flat, perfectly flat across here. And that dead bar keeps it flat. So on some brands, including the last one that I had, it did not have this bar. Your take up roller was right here. And so what you needed to do was as the quilt got bigger and fluffier and fatter, you had to adjust that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a different way of approaching it. But in this case, I've got this one bar and it keeps my surface always at the same level of flatness. Okay, and in the interests again of alternating sides on which I start, this time I'm going to start at the right again. The design I'm working on tonight is not particularly directional, but when I do flowers or leaves or something, I really, I'd like to just stay in the habit of alternating sides because you get a much more natural look. Otherwise, they kind of look like there's a stiff breeze blowing and they're all leaning in one direction. And we want manual mode back on, don't we? Yes, yes we do. I'm just looking that I've done everything. Yes, I have. Get my scissors out of the way, last pass.
the fabric I'm, the blue fabric right here is kind of like granny squares they're round but it's definitely crocheted stitches very very cute If you are enjoying this episode and the, what I have dubbed the Quilting Reality Show, do um, hit the like and subscribe buttons. If you also hit the bell, you will be notified whenever I'm going live on YouTube. And I do live stream quilting fairly frequently. And let's go for one more recap of the project and the products that I am using as we finish this final pass. So this is an Easter table topper. Pattern is uh, published by the Fat Quarter Shop. So in the show notes, you will find links to the pattern, to the fabrics that they've used, and to everything that you need to make one of these fun little toppers for yourself. They're a great showcase for fabrics that, um, because the eggs are kind of large and not cut into too tiny pieces, they're a great way to showcase sweet little fabrics. So that's in the show notes. As far as what I'm using, I'm quilting on my Bernina Q24 and I'm currently in manual mode, which means I've got it stitching at a set rate. I have mine set at 1400 stitches per minute. And so my movements of the machine is what is determining stitch length and how evenly I move is what determines whether that stitch length remains consistent. Uh, let's see what else. I'm using Isocord 100% um, polyester thread in the top in a very, very pale pink, much like the background of this little topper. And in the bottom, I have Deco Bob 80 weight thread, also 100% polyester in a soft cream color. I quite like the 80 weight because you can put so much on one bobbin. And who doesn't love a bobbin that lasts for a really, really, really long time? Also, this is episode one of two. So this one, as I said, is featuring the Easter table topper. The follow-up episode will be an Easter table runner. So they're kind of companion episodes in that you'll see that the little quilts match each other, but I will be quilting different um, motif on the other one, on the table runner. So watch for that table runner episode. And likewise, there will be links to all the products you need for that one as well in the show notes. So you can be all ready for Easter. Have a beautiful table. If you're a regular viewer, you will notice that I've changed the quilt in the backdrop behind me, which I try to do from time to time so you can see a few different things. This particular one, the golden one, is my own design and it was released, the pattern was released as a block of the month and I call it Starstruck. And each, uh, the stars were constructed in rows, so each month was a different star with a slightly different piecing technique you know, whether it was Trirex or whether it was um, mini stars or eight pointed stars, different things. Anyway, all that to say, when I was piecing this particular one, the golden one, I did several versions of it, but in this particular one, I did the very top row of stars, which you cannot see behind me because it's too tall of a quilt. But anyway, I did the top row of stars 
and I just was not happy with the coloring of them as, as it blended with the whole rest of the quilt. And so I took out that one row and replaced it with different print fabrics. And so next Friday, which is going to be, I believe, let's see, the 15th of March. Is that right, Dave? Can you tell me what next Friday's date is? Because I don't want to tell the story wrong. 17th. There we go. I figured that out in my head too while he was looking. Anyway, Friday the 17th, I will be doing um, the that runner. And it's going to be like a custom quilting instead of my usual edge to edge type like this one is. So if you're interested in custom quilting, um, including some simple ruler work, that is a great episode to catch as well. Starstruck the table runner. I'm kind of chuckling at myself over here because I realize I'm so used to doing these episodes absolutely live. And so this business of talking about today and tomorrow and next week and so forth, I always relate it to today when I'm filming. But in fact, to those of you who are watching, this episode was pre-recorded. So that table runner on the 17th will already be out into the world, but you can still find it by looking for Starstruck, the table runner. And we're finished. So I did mention this is part one of two. So when I loaded the backing on, it's, it's quite long and it is generous enough to do part two, the table runner on right after it. So I'm gonna go ahead and advance this and show you how I would load that up and then look for episode two with um, the Easter table runner to watch the quilting of that. It will be a different design than this one. But let's look for a minute at this loading process. As you can see, I have plenty, plenty, plenty of backing and I made sure I had enough batting as well. So this is the beauty of being able to use the same backing for two projects. Where ordinarily I would need several inches of backing here that would have been, you know, part of what was attached to my leaders and I would need that um, leeway of fabric, I don't need to if I'm going to put something else right below it. So let's grab that little runner and have a look at it. Here it is, same design, but just one row of eggs. So I'm going to put that very close to the existing piece. And now you can see all the waste I've got is this little three quarters of an inch or so in there. And I suppose I honestly could butt it right up against, but I honestly prefer to um, cut them apart and then trim each one up separately, just my personal preference. So that's what I'm going to be doing in episode two. So watch for that, the Easter table runner, and it will be with you shortly. So let's see, do we have any more questions or comments, Mr. Producer, before I go? Okay, there are no questions. Okay, quickie, quickie little recap. 
This was the Easter um, table topper that I worked on tonight, episode one. And then the Easter table runner will be coming as part two. And both of these are available from the Fat Quarter Shop. So I've got links in the show notes for the pattern for the fabrics that they used. Um, I think there's some instructional videos too on the piecing of it. So you can get everything you need if you want to make one of these little items, table topper or table runner for your Easter table this year. So thanks very much for joining me. Once again, I'm Susan Smith. You're in my studio, Stitched by Susan, and I will see you next time.